All right, good morning, everyone. Does everyone know Jerry? Nope. <coughs> everyone knows Jerry. So my name is Peter Costanzo. I have the facilities management practice at Imagine It. We're a large auto desk reseller, and I've been having lots of fun the last few years helping organizations pull BIM into their processes. And I presented here three years ago, and Jerry said, hey, you did a great presentation on all your concepts. Don't come back without a client. So I'm back, and I brought Joe Borstowski. So Joe is going to do 99% of the presentation. Um, Joe's going to talk about what he did at the Ohio State University um, with regards to BIM. And Joe will also tell you that nine years now in, yeah. It's still a changing process, um, so it's kind of like a living, breathing type of thing. Uh, to set the stage for Joe, just a few things. Um, I work and talk to architects and engineers, owners and construction people every week, and this is what I hear the owners say. The AEC community doesn't understand us. And on the flip side, I hear the same thing. Where we're at with BIM right now is kind of like lose-lose. The AEC community is using BIM to build better, faster, smarter, cheaper. The data that's in there that can help people in facilities isn't getting to them. So we're in lose-lose phase. What we want to do is get to win-win. It's not that hard to get there. Uh, so there are three things I get, you get from me today. One is we want to get to win-win. The second thing I want to do is uh, there was that Jerry Maguire movie where the guy screams, remember, show me the money, right? Well, if you think about that, in building design, the architects and engineers can tell, can tell much better than I can, you guys are saving money and being more efficient with BIM. We also know in the construction area, there's lots of value to be had. But the real, the real value is in the management of the building. If you can get the valuable data set about what is in a building to an owner who's got to maintain that building for a long period of time, um, there are tremendous cost savings. The problem is, as we look, executives always look at spreadsheets, right? These are over a very short period of time, and this is over a very long period of time, so it's often looked. Um, so the second thing I want you to look at me, we do is kind of show me the money, think about where it's going. So there's tremendous value. The other thing I want to say is, to implement BIM as an owner organization, you've got to work with your AEC partners, and they've got to work with you. To the AEC community, that's billable hours. I want you all to make more money. Joe will tell you as an owner, he happily gave the AEC partners he worked with more money because they gave him more value. And they were still building the building anyways. It was gravy to them. Everybody wins. Back to my concept of win-win. As we talk about BIM, and IT <coughs> people make fun of me when I present this because these are basic IT questions for any system. You need to, one of the things you got to stop thinking about is everything that we hear in the architectural world. It's all a data type of question. And you ask three simple questions when you build a system. The first question is, what data do you need? And I love doing needs assessments. We'll sit down with someone and they'll give us this big long list of data. The next question you ask is, how are you going to collect it? And this is very important as you think about BIM. BIM is not a piece of software. BIM is not several pieces of software. BIM can be different data coming from different places. So one of the things Joe has not done yet is much with point clouds, but point clouds are rapidly evolving and they're going to become part of this. So as you look at it, you want to look at it holistically. And then the other thing, if you're going to put information about equipment into a model that an owner is going to use to manage their facilities, it's not going to be collected in the architect's office. Someone's going to do it during the commissioning process. So you're going to want to look at different things. The last question, again, simple IT, is how will it will be kept up to date? So the other thing I'm going to tell you is you want your models to be simple. There's a simple concept called data integration that's been going on since the 80s. And it's all kind of new to us in the design, build, manage world because historically all this software didn't talk together. But once you have links in different systems, you can maintain them. So say, how will it keep up to date? One of the things that does make this shorter. So three things I want to leave with you. One, we want to go for win-win. Two, there is tremendous cost savings and a value proposition for both parties as you start to talk about the BIM thing. And three is, it doesn't need to be incredibly complicated. That being said, I'm going to shut up now and let Joe present. All right. <clears throat> um, 
So uh, thanks for thanks for coming out this morning. And uh, I'm, my name is Joe Porstowski. I am with the Ohio State University. I'm the director of Facilities Information and Technology Services. We manage a lot of facilities data, and specifically, we manage a lot of the floor plans, how space is being used, and a lot of information about our campus from a GIS perspective. Uh, and what I want to primarily talk with you about this morning is our Buckeye BIM initiative. And this initiative that we've been working on for about the last nine to 10 years is, is really divided into three parts. And the first is BIM for existing buildings, and how we've been taking our existing 2D AutoCAD uh, prints and floor plans and transitioning them into 3D Revit models for our university. And I'm primarily going to be talking about that um, for the majority of the presentation. I'm going to touch very briefly on what we've been doing with BIM for Design and Construction, and how we require BIM to be used on our on larger construction projects, and the kinds of deliverables that we are looking for at the end of our project, and then really briefly on uh, how we're tending to move towards using BIM in operations. So we think about this in the continuum of build, maintain, and integrate. We're building all these models of our campus. We're maintaining those models over the long term. We're integrating project data as we get it and changes that occur in the fields. In the field. So we have this objective that we set out at the very beginning of the whole project um, about nine years ago. We said that we wanted to enhance planning and communication, resulting in improved quality and speed of decision making. Said a little more uh, you know, shortly, we want to help the organization make better decisions more quickly. And there's a, as we've kind of gone through our BIM journey and looked at different ways of using, using BIM uh, in all the different facets you can use BIM, there's definitely those, those kind of use cases that don't necessarily mean both of these. We've got lots of cool things we could do with BIM that don't help the organization make better decisions more quickly. And because we have reduced, we, just, we only have so much time on our hands, uh, we really want to make sure that we're thinking about all of our use cases through this filter of how we make uh, better decisions more quickly. And I'll show you lots of outcomes and because we've made this, this transition, how we've been able to help the organization do that. So from a timeline perspective, this is definitely not an overnight success. It's not something that uh, is necessarily uh, quick or easy and it is something, as Peter mentioned, that evolves over time. 2008, 2009, we started seeing what was going on early on in the industry and we had a, um, an AE partner that we built a relationship with who just spent time with us and started asking, uh, asking us questions about what we're thinking about this. We could ask him questions about what his firm was doing with BIM. Uh, and that led to, in 2010, us hiring a student. And we said to the student, we don't understand what Revit can do or even how to build anything in Revit, but go spend the summer building one of our buildings in Revit. Uh, and good luck, uh, because we don't, we don't have time to help you. Um, so at the end of the summer, the student actually built one of our uh, kind of a simple building in Revit, just a basic architectural model. And we are immediately saw some of the value that we could have with this very basic model from, from how we organize and use our space and how we track our space. So we, we were able to turn that around and actually go to senior leadership and say, hey, here's, here's what it can look like if we start doing this for all of our buildings. And here are some of the other outcomes that we can see besides this nice pretty picture that we have. Uh, and we began in our medical center, which was around 6 million square feet, and, uh, and got the resources to go ahead and convert that. And that ended in 2012. Um, and then we then eventually started thinking about what a project delivery standard, which I'll talk about in a moment, could do for us. And right now we are we moved beyond the med center and are trying to complete the rest of the university um, uh, from a, a converting them to revenue. So let's talk about kind of this process of BIM for existing buildings. Right now, like I said, we've been working on this for about nine years. We are 89.2% complete with our campus. When we're done, we'll have about 36, a little, uh, almost 37 million square feet, probably a little bit more than that by the time we're done, with new buildings coming on board. That means we have about 265 buildings currently in Revit, uh, and that actually is more than 400 models because there's a number of, of, of uh, buildings that we've received through the design and construction process uh, that obviously we're getting more than one model with. But for the, that's about almost 33 million square feet that we currently have in Revit. One of the first things that we had to think about when we Sort of making this this thought of moving to Revit and <clears throat> moving to more of a BIM centric uh, workflow is this idea of an owner's model, because we we're not trying to construct the building with these with these models, right? We're just trying to we're using them for planning purposes, and so it's not a design intent or work intent. It's more of a an as maintained. We're saying we're going to maintain this amount of information in our models. This is how we're going to use our facilities going forward. And so we had to ask a lot of questions about. What do we need, what do we not need? If we're gonna make this, this transition from a 2D world to 3D, we have an opportunity to think through what data sets do we actually wanna put in our models. 
So we asked all of our customers, what do you want? What do you not want? What is useful to you? What helps you plan your facilities? And at the time, we were under the, the planning side of the house, and, and, and to some extent, we still are. And so a lot of the question was, what is going to help support the planning effort? What is going to help you plan your facilities most effectively? Now, if you ask enough of your people, and in our situation, if we asked enough of our customers, pretty much we would have built every single thing that, was, that you could see in a building. <coughs> we would have never gotten done with the Med Center alone because we just we'd have too much stuff. So we had to really think about what has the highest ROI, though. What was the most valuable? But also, we have to maintain this going forward. And so we had to ask ourselves, what can we reasonably maintain? So we had to kind of balance out what they're asking for versus what we can maintain and how valuable that type of information was. And what that ended up leading to was this kind of this base model, uh, which is what we are kind of what we call our owner's base model. It's walls, windows, doors in a lot of detail, but then we have less detail about roofs and plumbing and some of our casework. And this is we've been very careful about putting a fence around this list because a, a campus as large as ours, it's easy to go into a building and say, well, I, you know, I can pick up this piece of information, I can pick up that piece of information, I can model this. Uh, and especially when we hire, we use students for a lot of remodeling, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in a bit. Uh, they're, they're usually eager and excited, and they want to do a lot of extra uh, modeling, they're having fun with it, uh, and we have to tell them, you, gotta, you can't do that much, because we'll never get done. We have to keep, we have to be careful about the list of things that we choose to model. And so this is what we've settled on, and this is, this is all we do for the majority of our buildings, although there'll be some exceptions here in a moment I'll mention. So when we started off this, this whole journey, we, we recognized, though, that if we're going to build a lot of these models, and one of the things that our, our, our architectural partner really helped us think through when we brought them on as a consultant for this project, is you, you've got to think through how you're going to build these models. This is not AutoCAD. There's a lot more going on. There's a lot more complexity. And you don't want to have 300 models that are all set up differently, that all look differently, that all function differently. You really have to think through how it's going to work. So thinking early on of what kind of views and sheets and schedules we wanted to have, and how do we want the project browser to be set up, and what do we want it to look like so that every model when we opened it looked exactly the same? Uh, what are your naming conventions so everything is always consistent, and we are very, very strict about these types of things. Uh, you know, you think for those of you who are, um, you know, in the design side, uh, or anybody who's in the AC community, you live with a model for three, four years, maybe max, then you can get rid of that model and start over again. We can't. We have to live with these things for a very long time. So we have to make sure they are very consistent and, uh, they, and they have strict standards. Think about our family information and our content, making sure our naming conventions are very consistent. We use Uniform to help us uh, organize uh, where to find families and making sure they're descriptive and consistent. And also thinking about how what we're going to model to begin with and how detailed is that information going to be. Now, are we going to make these buildable pieces of, inf of content where you can go out and actually build that piece of casework that's actually completely realistic as to what's there, or is it going to be more representational? And for us in a big organization that has just tons and tons of different things that are out there, versions of toilets and, and hand dryers and all those types of things, it wasn't reasonable for us to have buildable content. So really we focused on representational. That's a piece of casework. It's this big. It's dimensionally accurate. It has this many sinks. It looks like this. You can use it for planning purposes. If you want to do some renderings because you want to do some advanced planning, sure, swap those out with the exact thing that's in there with the correct materiality. But in general, we're trying to understand space and how it's being utilized and what's there. Uh, focusing on parametric families. We can have keep our family library small and just um, stretch and pull them as we need. Right now, after nine years, we have a library that has about 760 families in it. And it's actually down from about 1,000. We actually reduced that family size uh, a lot of a year ago, got rid of some extraneous stuff, simplified some things. Uh, we really try very hard to keep this family reasonable but useful. One of the other things we have to think about, too, is that a lot of our, our end users are still looking at our plans in 2D. Uh, and so we have to make sure that our representation of this content is nice and clean two-dimensionally also. Because if you look at a lot of content in Revit and look at it you know, in 2D, it's just sometimes like just a bunch of mess of lines, right? You can't tell what you're looking at a lot of times. And uh, how do you represent a bunk bed, for instance, in a residence hall? We'll just put a two on top of it. So there's a lot of these things we want to think about um, from an owner's perspective to make sure that we have content that works for us and is also extremely useful to our end users in any format they might be using it in. Now I mentioned that we had, you know, we have this base model 
Um, but in some situations, like residence halls and parking garages, there are a number of additional items that we add to make those models more useful. Again, we, we've decided what those are. We stick to it. We don't add any additional information. Uh, there's a lot more than even what's on this list here for most of these. Then we also have an additional data model. So for a couple of buildings, we've gone in and added some additional information. Uh, and also, if we receive a project from the outside through the design process, we will actually maintain it at that additional data model. So we know that we can maintain some additional information. Uh, and eventually, we'll probably go back and, and uh, as a second phase of this whole project, um, move all of our buildings up to this additional data model. But again, we try to keep a really good fence around that, not letting ourselves expand that, uh, which you know, the kind of scope creep will really kill you in a long project like this. But beyond thinking about standards and uh, naming conventions and family and content, we also wanted to have a very clear and repeatable process for building these models. And so for us, like I said, we're using students. So it always starts off the first week, a uh, week of training. We don't assume they know Revit. We train through our process, so they only learn the things they need to know to build uh, models in our environment. So we're not going to learn how to build foundations, but we don't build foundations for ours. We don't need them um, for our models. And so they go through a process of gather, build, and check. So the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go gather any AutoCAD that we have existing. That's going to be our, our, our uh, maintained AutoCAD that we've been using for years. That is kind of our live drawing, but it's also going to be any kind of record documentation we have for that building. Then they're going to go out, they're going to do a defined process for field verification. We want to keep that process as efficient as possible. We don't need to measure every last thing, but we do need to collect a bunch of information that uh, we don't have in 2 days. Then they're going to build it, which obviously takes the longest period of time. Then we have a checking process. And since we're using students, we, want to, we have to make sure that we have a, a very good process for ensuring those models are clean, they're high quality, and they're consistent, again, and standardized. And so we, I'll mention a couple of these tools in a moment, but the students will do some automated model checking themselves, and then they'll pass it off to our BIM coordinator, who does those again and also does some visual auditing. And when she's happy, then we can publish it out to the network. Uh, and that makes sure that the end result of all of our models, year after year, no matter how many different students we're using, is consistent, the same, and the quality is as high as it can be. So I mentioned you know, we have all these processes that we've developed, and the first one is a field verification process, which may sound, well, that doesn't, do you need a process around that? Um, but what we found is that, again, we're using students a lot of times who have probably never done anything like this, uh, or they must think very, very minimal, maybe in their program. And we want to keep this process as efficient as possible. They're going to take around 10% of the measurements of the building to ensure that it's within our 2% deviation. If, if the AutoCAD that they have received is really messed up, then we may say, yeah, you're going to have to go measure the whole building and figure out why, why you have problems. But we're going to take a couple measurements and throw it in a spreadsheet and determine if, if the overall measurements of that AutoCAD are, are pretty good or close enough. They're going to take a bunch of 360 photos, which is going to be a game changer for us. A single picture in a, in, a, in a room gets us all the information we need when we're doing field verification. Uh, and there's a couple other things they need to do when they come back. And then they're going to get into the modeling process. And uh, just kind of walk you, we walk them through this whole process of how do you model? What do you do first? What do you do second? This is where you find this one thing in Revit that maybe you forgot from your training. But here's how you build our building step by step so that, again, they're always <coughs> consistent. One of the little things is an example of, of kind of how our process has evolved and the kinds of things that we've had to think through is, is just how to deal with survey points, project-based points. And those of you who work with this, you know that it can be kind of a tricky thing to grab your head around. And I know it was for us. It was, we had a hard time. We uh, definitely used our consultant a lot when we started realizing we had an issue with the way we set these up. But we have a lot of downstream systems that we want these models to work within, whether it be connecting Revit to another Revit model that are maybe adjacent, uh, whether throwing it into 360 or Navisworks, but also downstreaming into Esri, our Esri GIS environment. We don't want to have to put uh, our GIS coordinates in multiple different locations to make all these things work. So we had to really make sure we understood exactly how to make this work and document it carefully so every model function the same way so that we can automate a lot of our processes. Then I mentioned the audit. And when we first started this project in the Med Center, uh, we would just do a manual audit. So our BIM coordinator, she would open up the model, she'd look at a bunch of things, she'd try to figure out if they did everything correctly. And that process would take two to three days and per model. And frankly, it was, uh, it was definitely um, uh, 
mentally challenging and emotionally challenging, I guess you could say. So uh, it's just it's very hard to stare at a model and just be looking for problems for two or three days straight. And honestly, the, the end result wasn't great. You're going to miss spelling errors. You're going to you're going to you're going to you're not going to be able to check for things like wall joins. All these other things we cared about. There's just no way to do that. Uh, and so we realized when we started the rest of campus, we had to find some other solution to help us with this auditing process. And so we introduced Salibri, which is an IFC-based model checker that allowed us to automate a lot of the geometry checking, but also things like naming conventions and, and that kind of thing. Uh, this took our two to three day process that really did not have the best results down to about a day on average uh, with much better results. The quality was, very, was much higher. In fact, we ended up going back to all the MedCenter models and running this process again through uh, the, the slavery process for all those models just to get them as cleaned up as we knew the rest of the models were going to be going forward. One of the things we're missing, we were missing with the, with the Salibri was that it's, an, it's a disconnected system, it's an IFC-based system. And so a lot of the Revit-specific things that we cared about, you couldn't check automatically. So we started using Autodesk's Revit model checker tool, built a rule set around that that made sense for us, that checked our, what we care about. And that actually took our average uh, audit time down to about a half a day. So going from where we were before at two to three days, not very high quality, to about a half a day on average for the audit process for the full-time person. Keep in mind, it's the full-time person that's the time that I'm most concerned about here. Students are really cheap, so I don't care if they take a little longer to, to do their audits. So, um, uh, But we've been able to reduce that full-time effort and be able to hire more students, get more done without having to worry about it. Can we ask questions during the presentation? Uh, yeah, go ahead. That'd be fine. Okay. I'll, I'll just speed up if I have to. Uh, I was just curious how many uh, people you have in the department, how many students, how many full-time? Okay. So I have 10 staff on, my, on um, in our team right now. Five are GIS, three are on the architectural side, deal just with all the, everything I'm talking about today and also maintaining our drawings. And then two on deal with data, specifically space data and also record documentation. Students we average during the summer, uh, usually six or seven that are doing just this process and they continue on with us during the school year if they perform well and they also, some of them just for school reasons that can't continue. And then we usually have one or two additional ones that are just dealing with maintenance. And then the GIS side, uh, we have two to three. On the data side, we have two to three. So there's, all, it's, there's like 15 to 20 students on average in our department. So. Of course, along the way, we develop some other processes. How do you link an adjacent building if they're touching each other? How do you combine multiple buildings in one, in one uh, model? And even renderings. What do we, want? we want a couple different renderings done for every single building. How do you do that? What's our best practices? Again, these are students, they don't necessarily understand all the minutia of how to do these things the best way. And so we use this as an opportunity to help them uh, learn, expand their skill set, but also make sure that we're getting good quality deliverables from our project. But along the way, and this is not something that we started off with, obviously, at the very beginning. This, this came a couple of years into the project, is realizing the, the benefit, the value of developing certain customizations within Revit, some add-ins that would speed up our process. And so over the years, we've created all of these different tools that have really made it a lot easier for us to build these models and keep the quality up. One is the Space ID tool. So every room in our, in our buildings has this very specifically defined Space ID. It's building number, floor number, room number. In the past, you know, the first couple, first couple of years, they were having to hand type this, and the error rate was extremely high. So now they just type in the room number, and it creates the Space ID for them. That, that, goes, that was like a day process just for them to type it in. Now it's down to about five seconds. We also break rooms down further, whether it be a cube or a research bench or a couple other different things, into a subspace. And so now that actually does the same thing. It helps concatenate all those pieces together and deals with a couple things and how we tag those rooms also. Uh, we also have a sheet creator tool that allows us to create one sheet and then um, creates all the rest of the floors identical to that. Saves, again, saves time, reduces error, because we just create one correctly and it creates the rest of them for us. Now, once we've actually built these models, and they're in, in the wild, and, and changes are continuing to occur to buildings, every time we have a change to a building, we're exporting all these different file types, GWGs, IFCs, DWFs, PDFs, and we all want them to have a different view, uh, using a different view template also. And so we built a tool here that allows us to specify all that stuff, and with one click, export all those files and out to the right location on our network. For us, this is, again, just something that helps simplify the process reduce some of the tedium that can occur when you're trying to export all sorts of different files instead of having to do this individually for every different type. And then lastly, and probably most valuable for us, 
is that we have to maintain these models and upgrade them every single year when the Revit, when the Revit versions change. And, um, and for us, at the volume of models we have now, this would be around a month, probably at this point at least, of uh, man hours if we were just to sit there and manually upgrade each model. And the bulk updater that Revit provides, that Autodesk provides, really just does not work very well at all for us. And so we've been able to build a different tool for us that backs up our files first, then it upgrades them uh, in place, but it also reduces, it suppresses a lot of warnings and errors because we just need to get through it, we'll figure that, some of that stuff out later. And then it uh, moves things around in our network where it needs to go. This tool, this tool alone now only takes us uh, about three days to run in the evenings with no user interaction. So maybe an hour or two of actual human interaction. So for us, frankly, if we did not have something like this, we probably would not have been able to continue to expand our, our, our amount of Revit we use because it would just become way too time consuming every year to deal with this issue. I, I have a lot of questions, so <laughs> I can try to... Um Right now, point of time, but regarding plugins, yeah. uh, do you have your own developers in-house or you outsource it? No, we actually have used Imagine it to do a lot of our, our <coughs> development. We've actually on the third version of our plugins, and that's not an important story, that's a sad story, but um, but, uh, um, but right now they actually do all of our, our plugin development. Yeah. We do some of our own Dynamo scripting, although I would personally, like, we use it a Dynamo a teeny bit, uh, especially when we bring, we bring in models from the outside, so clean up the new Dynamo. I'm not a huge fan of it. It has, um, has its issues that make it a little difficult for us to manage those things over the long term. Okay, so imagine, imagine a cast, that possibility to cast yeah. that you provide. Yeah, they, have, they, have whole, they have a whole development team. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Look at that, I didn't even have to. <laughs> uh, I do like trying. the point that you said we're kind of on the third version, and I, I went to this earlier, and I want to stress this, that Joe and his team learned a lot over time. This is partially a moving, living, breathing thing. Yeah. And once you start with a base element and you have a good foundation, you can expand and contract. Uh, kind of expanding on those tool sets is that one of the things that we're actually implementing right now is what we're calling internally the BIM portal, but is a tool from Clarity called, a tool from Imagine called Clarity. And it really is just a way for us to have a single kind of web repository of all of our models and do a whole lot of interesting things with it. Um, at this point, because we have so many models, we really got really thinking about how are we going to manage this amount of models. We've done a lot to, as we've grown, as I've so, shown some of the plugins and the standardization, but what is the next step? And for, for us, it's you know, having a one place that plays people can go to to actually access this, these models. We have a challenge at Ohio State is that we have lots of different IT organizations that literally don't talk to each other, even though we're the same organization. And so we can't use shared folders or those types of things. So, but we have a lot of customers who actually are developing their own models. And they want to link into our architectural models. They've got their own furniture model or equipment model. We even have a couple people creating their own, own, own MEP models. And we want to be able to share all these models in one kind of common environment. That's one thing that's clearly is helping us do. We also want to be able to extract a lot of this great data that's in the model. We could ask questions like, how many toilets are there in, this, in these 400 buildings? Or um, how many sinks are, are there? Uh, or how many square footage of, of, um, of flooring there might be? Although we don't have a lot of information quite yet in the model, but we can estimate it. And sure, I can go get a schedule for you for one building, but if you want 400, it's just going to take me a long time to do that. Um, but now within Clarity, it's sucking all of that data into a database. So you're kind of extracting all of the information we know about a model, everything that we've put into those models, into a database and allowing us then to report directly on it. And we can aggregate that information out. Now we're early on in this, so we have a lot of work to do in customizing reports and that, but this is where we're starting to see more and more value from these models. BIM is building information modeling. It's not just pretty pictures. And we really want to extract all that great information that we have in our models and begin to use it, again, to help the organization make better decisions more quickly. But also the ability to automate a lot more of what we're doing today, even automate things that we're not doing today that maybe we just realize are too time consuming. Uh, we're looking at the so many automation abilities within the tool. And being able to actually understand better the health of our models. For instance, uh, this model here, we see that on the end that's the number of medium, medium warning messages. And so there's a problem with that model. Maybe there's a problem, maybe there's not, but at least I know that I need to go check this model out and see what might be going on. I don't have that visibility today. I'm not going to open up 365 models every day to try to figure out which ones are a problem. But there's a lot of capabilities around <laughs> model health that I can track without having to allow the system to do that for us. So this is kind of the next level for us and how we manage this large of a portfolio. 
We, it, so our plugin is just a straight plugin in Revit. Clarity is actually an entire, uh, it, it's, it's a set of servers actually inter in, internally that we use. So it's essentially a website for most people. That's the way they, they, it presents to them. But you need it for yourself. I mean, it's uh, but now, your own product. No, that's actually Imagine's product. Oh. Clarity actually built, built that. We just, buy it. we just bought it from, we're implementing it. Yeah. And that, does it uh, manage versions of different models? And uh, yes. actually how you extract, um, let's say, a sector that uh, you need to update. That, let's say, there is a well, renovation project going. How do you manage that? Does oh. Clarity help with this as well? Well, Clarity doesn't directly help with that. Now, the thing with us is that because we do all the updating ourselves, we wait till the project is over with. We have one person to go into a model. We're going to update the changes. We're going to republish the model. So we don't have some of the complexities of having maybe multiple people to model at any one time. Uh, or even if we have multiple projects happening in a, in a building at one time, our update process is somewhat um, sequential to all the entire process. So we don't we don't we don't deal with some of the challenges you might have around that. Now there are a lot of outcomes we've seen uh, for that have been really valuable to us as an, as an owner since transitioning to to moving to Revit for our buildings. And one is just improved accuracy. We've, we've taken this as an opportunity to field verify every one of these buildings, right? Getting out in the field, and not one of those AutoCADs that we had before was ever perfect. So this was an opportunity to ensure that our they were dimensionally accurate and that we, we had you know, caught every construction project that had occurred. And there's a lot of construction projects at a place like Ohio State that just kind of <laughs> happen without anybody knowing them. You know, they just, the uh, door gets put in here, or wall gets moved there. And this was an opportunity for us to get out there and do that and, and really be able to walk through the buildings. Um, even things like stacking the building correctly, and our AutoCAD's never stacked correctly. The, the elevator shafts didn't line up, the stairs didn't shaft, no matter how hard we tried, it just, they rarely ever did. And in Revit, you just don't have a choice. So the, those, it's little things like that that really helped us improve the quality of our drawings and improve the accuracy. But also, we're just adding a lot more data. You know, we, this is a three-dimensional environment now, so we have heights and volumes, we have exteriors, we have correct window placement vertically. We have all this great information that in the past, uh, we just didn't have, you know, in the 2D world, and it's made us uh, a lot more. It's made our data a lot more useful in a lot of different use cases. From an effort perspective, we actually believe it's quicker to update a Revit drawing following changes in the field than an AutoCAD drawing. It just understands what a wall is, it understands what the door is, it understands what the space is. So these types of things are simpler for us when, when changes occur to make changes rapidly in the model. And we can, we can manage all these models, as I mentioned, in a more systematized way. Now, there definitely are challenges in managing Revit over AutoCAD, but um, you can manage them in a more systematized way because at the end of the day, Revit is a database that has, happens to have a drawing component to it, and that allows a lot of uh, freedom and flexibility to have things like our plugins and to use tools like Clarity to manage models. We also have just more intelligent models. You know, our models know what they are. They know what a space is. They know what a wall, a wall is. They know what a door is. Uh, this is not what we had in AutoCAD. The day, AutoCAD is just lines on an electronic piece of paper. And with Revit, we have um, a much more intelligent tool to use to actually manage our systems, manage our data, and the ability to connect other systems, too, where we can actually start talking in the future, as I'll show, of how we actually take all this data across the university whether it be historical or live, and start connecting these pieces. Uh, Revit is really providing us kind of that foundation for being able to do that going forward. So these also serve as a future foundation for what we want to do. And kind of already touched on this a little bit, but when we get other kind of models, we can even discipline models in a building where we, we, we didn't have uh, we didn't have that before. We can, and maybe they didn't do an architectural model because it was just an HVAC project. We can then begin linking these into our what we have already. Um, and again, it's, we can provide these then to our design and construction partners. They can use them at least as a base to get started um, in whatever they're going to be doing with their project. <clears throat> now from a graphical perspective, some of the things that obviously are probably a little more apparent um, to this group, because a lot of you are going to use this on a regular basis, but internally we're able to do a lot more in planning spaces than we've ever have been before without having to engage outside partners. So this is an example of just a simple furniture layout. We have a senior leader coming in, provided the senior leader four or five versions of, of this layout. And you know, those of you who deal with drawings all the time, you understand when you look at this, kind of how to visualize it in your head. But a lot of the people that you're showing this stuff do not. And they don't want to say they don't understand what you're looking at. They'll just kind of nod their head and tell you, that, oh, yeah, I get it, I get what you're doing. And they don't, because then when they build it, they're just like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And they're unhappy. 
and then you have you know other issues. But um, uh, so we don't provide the senior leader actual renderings, and this is super easy. I mean, we had a student do this. We had the model done. Just drop some furniture in there, make a rendering of it, send it along. This senior leader understood exactly what she was going to get before she got here, and we found just anecdotally that around half the time a senior leader would come in in the old system of just giving you two knees and we're just they didn't they didn't like their office layout we have to do a little rework but with this the the senior leader said i knew exactly what i was getting when i came into my office it looked exactly like i expected simple stuff right this is very simple stuff but it's game changer if you want to help your organization make better decisions more quickly again doing it internally for us not having to spend any resources on that or in this case we have this weird concrete tower thing uh, and we were putting some system furniture in it which is all the red stuff and the original design of this, they used like five or six foot height walls, uh, and it covered up the windows. And I don't know why a planner in our organization did this, but they did. Uh, but when the customer saw it, they said, why are we doing this? Why don't we just you know, chop down those walls, maybe put some clear plastic here so that we can get some light in. Simple fix. 30 minutes back in the office solved the problem, but it would not have been noticed in a 2D world. Again, we're able to do this in-house, help people see what's going to happen in this environment early, Make better decisions up front, not spend money either uh, spend money after the project changing it or just being unhappy with the outcome. Uh, even here, we're able to put in this wasn't no walls changed here, but putting the exact uh, wall coverings in, the exact marketing material that they wanted, uh, the marketing team wanted to put in the space, the exact floor covering from uh, from the manufacturer, being able to produce renderings to help senior leaders understand how a space was going to look, or donor recognition. We've done a lot of work with donor recognition, putting names on the outside of the building, or outside conference rooms, or allowing uh, donors to see what a conference room or a lobby or an area that they might name looks like before the project is complete. And this has been very helpful in, in you know, closing some deals, uh, being one piece of that puzzle, uh, and helping them understand what their space might look like. Now that we have just a lot more models available, and we have a lot of really good GIS information, this is our student union. We want to build potentially a, new st a little stage here in the front being able to contextualize the design. Again, internally, not having to go out uh, to do this type of work. We have a student-led design team uh, that's just a bunch of junior and senior level uh, interior architects, or interior designers and architects, and they don't take all this great, this great BIM data we have and develop some of these conceptual designs, these early, early thinkings we have about what we want to do. Or this building here where we're thinking about putting a road through this area, and maybe when we're going to do that, let's talk about putting this nice glass facade in the front of this building and thinking about how we want to rebuild it. Again, in, internally, as an owner, we're able to do this type of work and it's not hard. Or our stadium, which I have to show off, of course. This took us forever to build. Very difficult. Two, two students and one of our staff had to spend a good amount of time on this. Um, it looks really good now. We really like it. My seat is like right there. So if you're curious, um, a very overpriced seat. Uh, and also, you know, we have farms. We have lots of farms, and the students wanted to make sure when they developed this rendering that you knew it was used for cows. So they put some cows in there. It is not on a desert plain. They just didn't put any of the surrounding grass. It would have been nice to at least put grass, but I guess not. So, so that's, that's really uh, what we've been doing with existing facilities and some of the outcomes, some of the tools, some of the way that we've, we've gotten to where we are today. And I want to touch briefly... In, uh, very briefly, on uh, just kind of where we went from there. So, once we started understanding what Revit could do for us, what BIM could do for us, we started watching what the industry was doing. We started talking about what it would mean to actually require BIM to be used for design and construction. So, back to your question in the back. And we had a really good sense at that point of um, we weren't going this blind. We, we, we really understood what we wanted as an outcome, uh, or at least as close as we could at the time. And so we decided we want to build a project delivery standard for BIM. So these typically talk about two things. How are you going to execute that project using BIM or, uh, or, and or what are the deliverables going to be? How are they going to be formatted? What are you going to get at the end of a project? At Ohio State, we really wanted to focus entirely on those turnover documents. We don't tell you a lot about how to execute a project. We assume that most teams have a good way that works for them, um, and that's not important to us. All we ask is you tell us how you're going to do it and then you meet some of our BIM goals. You need to do these certain things on a, on a BIM project. So we focus a lot on the turnover documentation. Now, if you want to see, so I'm not going to talk a lot about this today. This is a whole other presentation by itself. If you want to see everything we have, our, our project delivery standard, which is only around 25 pages, 
our BIM execution plan, all the tools that we now give to our AEC partners to help them effectively meet our standard. It's all available at fod.osu.edu slash resources. Uh, there's a BIM section there and all, all of it's available to you. You can always contact me too if you have additional questions about it. Um, but we, we kind of identify a certain number of, of turnovers, uh, turnover documents. That we call conform design intent models. And when we receive those at the end of the project, then again, we have processes for that too. We want those models we receive at the end of a project to look just like all the rest of the models that we've been building, except they have a lot more data. And so we have a process of cleaning up those models. And how do we go about that? And what's the right way to do that? Um, we have tools for that too, like the view and sheet deleter, because there's always a lot of views and, views and sheets in there. We don't need the vast majority of them, so we get rid of them. We strip, we, we, we clean up these models and make them a lot more, a lot more lightweight. But we get rid of everything that doesn't have geometry associated with it. We have a way to get rid of all of our the old lines and patterns in there. Um, so we just have a lot of tools that help us, a couple more tools to help us get through this process, get these models into our environments, so we can start managing them just like all the rest of our models we've been building over the long term. And I'm going to talk oh, just very briefly on this one slide. This is kind of where we're headed, though. This is our utopia here, is, is taking all these models that we see, whether it be from the construction process, design construction process, which those models obviously have everything we want. They have all the discipline models in there. They have all the assets we care about. Um, and being able to then talk about how do we get this great information into the hands of our frontline workers, those who are actually operating and managing our facilities every day. And so, there are, there are definitely technologies that can do this out there, and for the next couple of years, this is where we're going to be focusing our effort. Um, a lot of them don't scale great, and so that's one of the things that we're still kind of keeping our eyes on, but um, we're trying to connect all these systems. How do we connect in an intelligent model through a web browser in the field, these models, so that if you're in the field, you can, you can access work order history and asset information and O&M information and any archived documentation we have or <coughs> automation information coming from our devices. Whatever it might be so that you can make the most informed decision you can in the field. Now we think this is where we're going to see the biggest value. As, as Peter already mentioned, the, huge, the biggest value for us as an owner is how we operate these facilities over the long term. And a lot of the use cases I already showed you have already paid for this project many times over because of the reduced labor costs and just the speed that we can make decisions. But this is where we see the biggest benefit long term, is if we can have the right data in people's hands and the right tools in people's hands, we can make more informed decisions about how we manage our, our facilities over the long term. So I want to just wrap up here uh, with some lessons learned. Um, these lessons are for a single owner, lots of buildings, managing them for a very long time, you know, for 30, 40 years probably until something besides Revit comes along. Starting with this idea of just making sure we we do proper planning and focus, not getting obsessed with planning to the point where you don't do anything, but making sure you ask good questions. What needs to be modeled? What doesn't need to be modeled? What's actually going to be used and is useful? What has the best ROI? What's the, what can we maintain? And staying focused. It's so one thing that I definitely see owners kind of get off the rails on is that they say, but I want everything. I want all this stuff because I know I can maybe use it someday. Well, but then you're not going to be able to manage that. You're not going to be able to access it. It's going to be hard for you um, to do that. So keeping proper focus as an owner, thinking through what makes the most sense for your organization. Having training. You know, we use students for all of our work, so we want to make sure we're effectively training them. It's not just one week, but it's also then a cadence of training for the first six weeks so that we learn additional skills that they need to learn along the way, different tools. But also training for our end users. We're not, we don't want to just develop these models for our benefit, for my team, but we've got lots of people out there that want to use Revit in their environments, whether it be furniture, equipment models, like I mentioned, um, in other ways. So we provide training to the university for anybody who wants it, um, for any of our staff, up, up around how some Revit basics, and then, then Revit advanced tools. And so we, we provide this training so that we can make sure that our users can use all these tools to the, to the, best, of their, to the best of their ability and, and in ways that make sense to them. We also do a lot of consulting with a lot of our customers. Hey, you want to use Revit? Let's talk about what that might look like in your environment. Let's keep it as simple as possible to get what you want. We also have continually improved. As, as Peter said, we've learned a, a lot of stuff over the years. We've made a lot of mistakes, and we keep finding ways to refine our processes and refine the way our templates are built and uh, looking at our families and thinking about our family library. And <clears throat> there's a certain point at which uh, we had, especially when we started on campus, we realized we want to make a lot of changes to, for our non-med center buildings going forward. And they were significant enough that we went back and actually changed the, the, the original med center buildings 
um, so that they would be consistent again with all the rest of ours. Now we won't do that again, regardless of what we learn, because it would be way too painful now. But we are constantly learning a little bit more about how we improve our process to make it to make it better. Standardize everything from processes to naming conventions to, to, to families. That allows you then to automate a lot more, from model checking to the way that we manage our families with Unify, to how we manage our models with Clarity and our plugins. Uh, once you have things standardized, you, it's a lot easier to think about automation and then reducing your workload and not doing some of that kind of really boring grunt work. But lastly, also partnering and collaborating. We started this project thinking about what our customers and stakeholders cared about. We did not make these decisions uh, in a cube somewhere and said, please use our stuff. Um, we actually asked them and, and understood what they cared about, especially when we got to our project <coughs> standard, which was a larger, much larger stakeholder group and really on making sure we understood from them what they wanted and what made sense and what would help the organization move forward. Externally, we've had some very long-term consultants that have worked with us and really helped us fill in those gaps. As an owner, we, po we can't possibly know everything there is about, about this area, and so we've had some extremely smart and uh, capable consultants and, and that have worked with us over the long term for the last 10 years. Now, we've also taken all of the stuff we've learned that I just talked to you today about the Cat to Bim stuff we packaged it up into a BIM switch. We actually are selling that now. And if you are interested in that, you can talk to Peter, or you can go to his website too, which will give you more information about that. Now we do have some ongoing challenges, things that we continue to try to figure out. How do we manage these models effectively? How do we keep them up to date? We start thinking about MEP. Uh, we do a pretty good job on architectural models, but we, I don't have enough staff to manage all this great MEP that we're having to, uh, coming into our environment now. And so how do we do that in the future once it becomes more uh, useful to the organization. How do we collaborate better with other parts around, <clears throat> around campus, which is related to uh, ex using clarity and expanding the use of clarity, <clears throat> and furthering the, the automation, the data collection efforts there, and then how do we use it more effectively in operations, as I showed. And we're also trying to work on how do we take all this great data, this BIM data we have, and move it into our Esri GIS environment and visualize our entire campus uh, more fully. So these are just some of the things that we continue to bat around continue to work through to improve the way that we use them in our environment. And the last thing I want to talk about is just, for those of you who are AECs in the room, is how you can help support owners. And these are some of my thoughts around <clears throat> when you're interacting with owners and trying to think about how you might best move them towards a more BIM-centric workflow. Uh, the first thing is I think you just can raise awareness with them. There are definitely a lot of owners out there who just don't understand or don't, haven't spent the time thinking about what BIM might do just for their projects. Don't even think about what it might do for them internally. And how does it help them um, to have BIM in their projects? And helping educate them on the, the ways in which it changes the design process, uh, the coordination process, the construction process. Helping them think through then, the next step is, hey, this might help you as an owner after we leave. And what are some of those things you might help them educate them on that it might actually be useful to them as an owner um, post-occupancy? Uh, and then also just delivering high quality turnover documents. When you do that, they're going to see the value of this information. When it's, when it's accurate and it's, it's got the information they need to manage their facilities, they're going to start understanding the value of BIM for their organization. And I think once you get past that stage, you can start talking about these ideas of a formal partnership, which is what we've had with our, our great partners for a number of years. Starting with an, a great AE firm, and then they combined uh, with a, a contractor to really provide us some, some uh, great service. Uh, partner, with, uh, partner with them in developing their standards and their expectations. Ask them some questions up front about what they want at the end of the project. Maybe you can help them focus your, your turnover documents at, to, to that goal. Getting to know the process and pain points, spending some time with them. Maybe even developing a process to maintain their dens going forward. Maybe they don't have the, the resources in house, but they want to have some of the values of the value of that. So that's another opportunity to help um, bring some more services into your company or pr providing a specific FM model at the end that is more cleaned up and stripped down that they could use uh, in, their, in their environment instead of having them clean up the whole model. Um, and that's gonna be another uh, service that could be very valuable to somebody. And then again, what kind of data can you provide? And understanding what they want, and thinking about that at the very beginning of the project so that you can provide that at the end of the project. So I think these are some ways that, um, that you can actually help advance owner's use of BIM. The reality is most of us owners, just like you, are very busy. We're not thinking outside of what we have to get done every day. Uh, and I'm very thankful for some, <coughs> some exterior partners that took time with us to help us think through what, what BIM might do for us uh, and allowed us to really start this, this journey 10 years ago. 
So um, that, I guess I'll turn it back over to you. So yeah. Slide left. So to kind of close out and just click through and do them one at a time, if you take two steps at what Joe did, and you went through an iterative process, but the answer to these three questions is what data did they need in their models, right? How they were going to collect it and they went along. Um, and this is very important how it will be kept up to date. This other thing he left out that I point out a lot when I present, we're going to have a recession at some point. He's going to get his staff cut. You know what the first thing's going to do? Maintaining his models. Because he still needs to mop the floors and facilities and all sorts of other things. So as you look at this, um, one of the things to take a look at is make a, a bite-sized chunk that makes sense. Um, the other thing to his slide where he's looking forward, Joe started with simple spatial models. Um, to do space management, and uh, so here in <coughs> Toronto is the COSI report, right, that you have to send in, I think it is? I or, think I'm not in the planning. The report, got, got, but he's got a report to um, the state of Ohio mm -hmm. how um, the university uses their space. There's I reports for the know. medical center, so that was one of his benefits, but the systems coming back, the maintenance systems, the work order systems, the asset management system, they're all developing those. <coughs> Joe now has a base map of his campus. He knows where every room is in every building, right? And you can start populating different things within that. Um, so it is something that will serve a lot as they move forward for all sorts of other purposes. We're not that far, and I'm doing a presentation at AU where we're gonna, like our phone, we'll go to a campus like OSU, and I think you're doing a pilot on this, and say, hey, I gotta go to the chemistry building, room 104, how do I get there? <coughs> you know, click open your phone, and just like, you know, Right now we can do outdoor, it'll pull us indoor as well. And the base map that he's got in these models is providing all of that information. 